School is back, and Dick's Sporting Goods has what you need to win your year. We've got everything from cleats to sambas, dunks, and more. Plus, the hottest looks from Nike, Jordan, and Adidas. Find your first day fits in-store or online at dicks.com. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Prime. From streaming to shopping, Prime helps you get more out of your passions. So whether you're a fan of true crime or prefer a nail-biting novel from time to time, with services like Prime Video, Amazon Music, and fast free delivery, Prime makes it easy to get more out of whatever you're into or getting into. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to learn more. Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, writer and broadcaster Sam Baker. How does it feel to walk into a room and know that everyone already thinks they know all there is to know about you? That's the position today's guest, Melanie Sykes, has found herself in repeatedly over the last 30 years. After starting out modelling and then moving into TV and radio presenting, Melanie decided she'd well and truly had enough in her 40s and stepped back from broadcasting to reclaim her own narrative. She launched her magazine, Frank, in 2016 and has now followed that up with a book, Illuminated, Autism and All the Things I've Left Unsaid. In it, she discusses the good, the bad and the often ugly of a life lived under the camera's glare, of being, as she puts it, too young and too famous for comfort. So I know that nobody can do anything to hurt me again because I've got me. I've completely got me. I met Melanie in a studio in North London to talk about discovering her creativity in her 40s, the relief of being diagnosed with autism and ADHD at 51, and what she learned from her subsequent breakdown. Melanie talks candidly about the way the media has portrayed her, and we discuss being sapiosexual, taking a year out from sex, why men her own age don't have enough energy, and she won't be settling anytime soon. As you'll hear, after a lifetime in the male gaze, nobody is telling Melanie's story but her. What was it about now that made you think I want to write this book and revisit um, everything? I wanted to write the book a year and a bit ago. I was just had so much I wanted to say. It was really that simple. So much stuff that I'd never said and really wanted to say so that everybody knows who I am and where I'm from and you know what my experiences have been. And I wanted to do it before I was diagnosed anyway. So I just wanted to. I suppose what interests me is like is this time of life often triggers reflection, recalibration. Yeah, everybody's very individual. So for me, it's just a constant evolution of me and my feelings. You know, I turn 50 and I say in the book, when I turn 50, I really didn't give a fuck. Like I just thought, oh, life raft, yay. Anybody try and disrespect me now, I'm 50. But actually, I wish I'd known that at seven, eight, nine, oh, 10, God, 11, yeah. my entire life to understand that I'm worthy of respect. And it took me to 50 to go, well, fuck you, I'm 50, and don't even dare. But like with a smile, I'm such a pacifist, man. I'm not interested in arguing and fighting with people. I'm just like, this is it, this is me. And I had some good people helping me with that during that period. I felt trapped in a cycle of the industry. And I had a friend in France, actually, who was just saying, fuck it, just do your own thing, man. Just do your own thing. So I started to do my own thing. I was going to say you haven't pulled any punches. You call a spade a spade and you don't it doesn't feel like you're pussyfooting around the subject it's like you face it head on all the things that happened to you how was that were you worried about that or would you just go like this is me take it or leave it so I'm not afraid of being me at all no that book is just me I like me though I think I'm all right yeah. do you know what I mean so yeah. if anybody has offense at my book or thinks badly of me because of my book it says more about you than it does about me because my heart is golden you know I've yeah. just been through some shit and come out the other side and if you want to take any wisdom from it do but don't judge me you know, so I'm not yeah. bothered. I wouldn't have written it if I didn't want to. I mean, I am my own boss. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have anybody telling me I can't or shouldn't or wouldn't. I've got me and my intuition and I just work with that. In the book, you say you were putting a mask on it 
from a really young age. Can you remember how how and why that started? My family home, my mum and dad were working and they were really busy and I was just probably, I don't even remember when I started to contain me. I don't know. I can't really remember. I think it was really early on because the minute we come out of the womb, we're being conditioned by society or our parents or the schools or whatever and you just start going along with it. Everybody is victim to that. Most of us get coerced, especially women. Mm. We get coerced really early on. It's so early, we don't even remember it. That's how fucked up it is. Totally. I was going to say, do you think it's worse for women? Because it seems to me that it is. Well, you know it's worse for women because the world is is worse for women because it's run by blokes. We know this, don't we? Well, you'd think, wouldn't you? We do know it, but we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. So, I mean, there's stuff that's happened to me at work where I've not been able to complain because I don't want the big Ferrari and I don't want to lose my mm. job because I've got to pay the rent. But I've dealt with it and then dealt with it by not going back into the fray. So I've just found myself in situations I don't like and got myself out of mm. them. I've done that on a few occasions and I mentioned them in the book. And nothing happened when I was a model because it was a lovely environment. I had fun It wasn't necessarily a great job for me because I'm shy in front of cameras and not the greatest mover, although I've been doing a lot more moving lately. I've been doing, you know, I'll dance in my living room and just like really go for it, you know, or... And it's good to know your expanse, you know, to fill the space that you own. And I'm really getting free in my body, which I really needed. But then I was just like, okay, this hurts. I'll knuckle down. I'll get through whatever I've got to do. Go home and relax. And some of that in some points was drinking. But I'm sober six years in May. I don't have any tools uh, apart from... Well, I have got tools for life, which is breath yoga exercise reading art travel all the beautiful th- food mm. all the beautiful things there are out there i'm just like pursuing those more regularly and and i'm no longer in a world that's toxic or is promoting bullshit narratives that i don't want to be part of it so i've just i've just got out of it in fact I was speaking to the editor-in-chief of The Big Issue and he said to me, it's brave that you Mm. change careers. And I just was like, it was nothing to do with bravery. It was to do with survival. But like you said, you might take a while, but you get yourself out of a situation eventually, whether it's a marriage that you're not happy in or a job that you're not happy in. Yeah, because I care about my... do they? No, that's what I'm saying. Your intuition is... Whatever your intuition is telling you, you need to act on it. If you're in pain in any way, it's because it's not right for you. Whether it be a mild email with a fluttering of something that just goes, ooh, don't like how that lands... It's because it doesn't land well, because it doesn't suit you, because it's not right for you. My whole career, you know, it's so funny because if you're not on telly for a while, people call you has been. But sometimes I've not been on television because I don't want to do any of the shows I'm being offered. Because I care about quality of what I'm doing. And I don't want to prostitute myself too much because you'll see it because I cannot fake it. And then then why would I put myself in an uncomfortable situation where I'm not looking good either? It's like, and I don't mean in a physical sense, I just mean look like that I'm not enjoying myself because I love life and I love laughing and I love working with certain people but the industry and how it's attached to the media and how it just does not protect you and uses you as some kind of fall guy for all their fucking mistakes it's not nearly enough money and even if it was I wouldn't want to do it you couldn't drag me back onto television it's like they just don't understand people having boundaries those big bosses so whether it's a big publisher or a media company if they offer you a gig that they think is good regardless or they think is good for you because they they're setting their standard for you it's just a job and they choose you because you're the best person for it so it's yeah. not a gift it's a job because exactly. you're good at it yeah so I don't feel like I have to feel beholden to somebody for giving me a job that actually elevates their platform they just think well you're replaceable you'll fucking do it you'll shut up I mean I remember having to fight for equal pay that was a hilarious conversation with my agent to someone that I knew was negotiating that and did you get it yes I fucking did because my agent's going back to me well they've said you know they'll give you like you know two thirds and I was like 
No. But they, the management do not know what to do with that, do they? they well, they don't said yes know. in the end. It's disrespectful. You know, I've been in the industry a really long time. I've been a broadcaster for a really long time. And I've worked with some of the greatest people. And I've worked with all these wonderful newcomers that come up. You know, like I'm talking about behind the scenes people. All the runners on Des and Mel are so amazing and wonderful and came up with inspirational ideas and were just cool. And now they're running channels. You know, I've had some really wonderful experiences with it, but it's usually with the people that really just are working on the ground just getting this stuff out um you know so there's been elements that have, that have been fun but yeah i've not been like i've not been just there to adorn the place i've been working my fucking ass off so i'm paying for it <laughs> i mean i know how you feel about it because i've read the book but that kind of sorry my squeak <laughs> no squeak away we'll cut we'll cut the squeak <laughs> <laughs> That's my water bottle, just in case you keep me. Yeah. It's not. It's not my hips or anything. Yeah. It's not your knee joints or anything like that. No, oh, they oh. do. Cra- my t- it's so funny. I was in yoga the other day and we had to put our feet in the air, the air and it's all like move your ankles and it was click, oh, click, they all crack. Of so yeah. brilliant. I've got such clicky ankles because I've sprained them both over the years, so they're just so clicky, <laughs> and my toes are so clicky. So yeah. <laughs> I mean that kind of bullshit way that the media treated you. They treated you like you were an adornment, didn't they? Well, I, the, I, I mean, the, worst, the worst atrocities were into being interviewed by women who just wanted to know who I'd fucked and what I was eating. And I just thought, come on, darling, you've got to have a more intelligent question than that. But they didn't. And I wasn't going to offer it up because I don't really trust the media. So I just went along with it. So the same narrative went out. And it got to a point where people were just, they were wasting my time because I would go to do an interview. And I'd say, why are you asking me questions based on some bullshit that one of your colleagues wrote about me like three years ago and none of it was true you keep repeating the same thing Mm. and then you do you think oh I'll I'll go and be interviewed uh, for example like a health magazine and you expect a journalist to talk to you who knows their stuff about health but instead you've just got a regular journalist who writes for everybody and you're just ending up saying the obvious things like well you just eat well and you exercise and I felt like sometimes journalists just wanted to know what my secret was for themselves Yeah, and I don't and the secret is just be yourself. You don't write what I'm doing down. Find what's good for you. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your magazine, The Frank. What made you decide to start it? It was a friend of mine. I, I desperately wanted to get out of the industry. I, I was going to yoga with a friend of mine. And I was saying, I've got to get out. I've got to do something more stimulating. It's just such bullshit and everything. So she said, oh, you know, why don't we start a magazine? And we decided to do it for women over 40. That was back when I was 40, early 40s, I guess. Or maybe late. I can't remember the timeline, man. But anyway, and I was like, yeah, and you know what? Let's use models who are who are actually over 40 and let's just <laughs> write some stuff. And, and so we, I started organising photo shoots and setting up all that and then doing the interviews and doing the editing and then I had a friend who was doing all the sort of like online work and it was just really brilliant I just realized very quickly that I've got an eye for a page and I just knew what I was doing I just knew what I was doing I've been on both sides of this thing I've been a model watching everybody do that and I've yeah I've been on every side of it so I could just do it and it's authentic and it's real but at the moment I'm not managing to do so much on it because time money and it's morphed now into just all women to be honest I feel ageless anyway that I'd rather just it be for women across the board and that's what it turned into and I need to develop it more but it's now a website it's ticking over and when the right time comes up and somebody help help me with it I will ignite it in the way that it deserves but it gave me a perspective on my god my instincts my creativity my brain I mean it was just like you know and I am an extremely creative person it's been completely um I'd numbed it I guess although I was always going to look at art and I was constantly reading and a lot of my friends are creatives and I was so interested in their process didn't think for a second that's because I am but I am do you think 
Because you were told, you? and this happened to me with a careers teacher who basically told me that I could be a nurse or a teacher and that's that because I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to work on smash hits. It's like, girls like you can't do that. And you were told you basically you should be a hairdresser, weren't you? Yeah, but I wasn't told I couldn't do something. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I think that's a very terrible experience you had there when you actually had a passion and you knew what it was and you were being told you couldn't have it. I didn't have that. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was too immature. And we're talking, I'm an autistic person mm. and I was I was a bit delayed in terms physical not mental physically slower than the other girls I was the youngest in my year I would have been better off in the next in the next year anyway um I didn't know what I wanted to do and they suggested hairdressing there's nothing wrong with hairdressing it just wasn't for me it isn't for me and it hasn't been for me and that's the end of it but yeah nobody I didn't know what I wanted to do my mum gave me the time to think about it and then I ended up modeling so I didn't have to think about it too much longer So tell me about the autism diagnosis. What made you get tested? Um, I was putting together a proposal for a documentary about the education system and how it doesn't serve any of us, but mostly neurodivergent people. And I was working with someone and um, we were having a little meeting about what we wanted to do. And just in conversation, he said to me, I think that you're probably ADHD and you should check that out and also check out for autism that if you're autistic because you don't have autism it's not a disease or anything it's just the way that your brain is wired so I am autistic so anybody that says they have it is using the wrong terminology and it's kind of really dangerous and that needs to change um, because it makes it sound like there's a medical flaw and that's not true. Mm. So I'm going to be on a mission to be clarifying and changing the narrative around that. But yeah, it was just based on how I could, how I was communicating with him, how I, how I am basically. I mean, I demonstrate autism and ADHD just sitting here. This is what yeah. I, it looks like for me. Had it occurred to you before that that you might be autistic or have ADHD? No, no. The ADHD made sense. As soon as he said it, I I just thought, oh, man, of course. Because over the years, I've been so... And my ADHD is... I have a million different ideas, and I do them all, and I want to finish them all, and do. Some people get loads of ideas and can't finish them all. I do finish them all. Like, I would just... Yeah, I'd have to say to myself regularly, out loud, fucking sit down! Yeah. Sit down and just stop moving around. For fuck's sake, I literally say that to myself out loud. I'd put myself on my bed and go, fucking sit down. So and it was a no-brainer that that was going to come up trumps. And then, um, and also, I started to compute. I'm so sensitive. My peripheral vision is unbelievable. I know what's going on behind me. And I see every single thing. And I'm so empathetic that I take on everybody's feelings as well so it's really like oh even talking about it makes me want to wriggle out of that feeling but I found breath work has just been the biggest game changer of my life really I don't know much about that it's like just every time you take a breath it's almost like take it from your toes to, uh, from your toes through your body and out the top of your head and back down again not yeah. but like proper and when you're when you're grounded in that way everything slows down everything is manageable and you don't make mistakes and you certainly don't you're not a traitor to yourself either because you're not caught up in moments you're just authentic whatever feels good you do and what doesn't you know not to, to steer well away from but breathing just centers you in a way that makes all of that possible for me and anybody that does it Was the diagnosis a relief? Yeah, it was amazing. I felt like I'd won the lottery. So not a relief, it was a celebration. It was like, thank you, God. Now I know what that's all been about. I can now take care of my myself and everybody else can just step away if they don't want to be near me. Because your younger son is autistic, isn't he, and has ADHD. Had you ever thought... Have you got things in common with him? Have you ever... Yeah, well, I, well, I do... Yes, we're both really sensitive. We're both empathetic. Um, but I didn't put that together at all. So no, no. Once you got the diagnosis, did it make you better able to be kind to yourself? That's an interesting question. Um, I think my breakdown made me want to be kind to myself, not the diagnosis. I was so wounded... And in pain when I had the breakdown, that all I could do 
was do everything in my power to not hurt like that again. So I have slowly, slowly come back to life. My therapist would say, I mean, I have complex PTSD from the industry I've just come from. And yeah, I'm, yeah, I have PTSD. So I've got to take care of myself all the time, all of the time. And I'm worth it because I'm really such a kind, loving person. I mean, I'll do anything for anybody. And I always have done. Um, But I guess when you've been written up in a way and people make assumptions about you and things like that, historically, you start to think, oh, and I've looked back on my life and I've done nothing but good. I've made mistakes, but they've been my own. If I've hurt somebody I've never meant to, I've got nothing but love to give. Do you know what I mean? So I know that nobody can do anything to hurt me again because I've got me. I've completely got me. That's such a good place to be, though. That's such a good place to have got to. Mm -hmm. Which is back to self, basically. It's back to my, as I was, I'm, I'm now back to what I was born to be. I'm back home with me. I don't need to get anything from anywhere. It's all here. And I love my own company so much. The only thing that I miss is really belly laughing like with someone. And I don't really have, I have like a couple of friends that I can do that with. And I do love to laugh like, and I get the giggles in the most terrible circumstances. But they're funny, make it funny because it's so not allowed. But um, yeah, I'm just really happy on my own. Anybody that ever comes up always has to like burst like my peace, man. It's <laughs> like, it's amazing. I was reading a book the other day and I was on my own. I was reading a book and I was laughing about it. And this guy came over and he's like, excuse me, are you, are you, are you? And I was like, Melanie, yeah. And then he was like, what are you reading? And I thought, oh my God. I would never do that to somebody who was reading. Would you? No. No. Go up and introduce yourself. People have got, like, no manners. He was a broadcaster before you say anything. <laughs> he was an ex-broadcaster. Do you think that you there are some people who think you're slightly public property? I don't know what people think. <laughs> I don't care. No, I just don't know, so I can't answer your question. I have no idea what people think. I know how they behave. I don't know what they think. But that would be behaving like they thought that that was completely okay. Yeah, well, I mean, he started to... It was hilarious, really, the conversation. He started to tell me he didn't like certain people. And one of the people was was a friend of mine. And I was just like, do you know what? I wanted to say, can you, like, fuck off? But I didn't. I was just... I was kind. And people are strange, aren't they? You know, and I have to just keep my chill within it because what I'm noticing more and more people reveal themselves to me all the time they think they're saying something about me but all they're doing is revealing who they are and it's really interesting to listen and watch you like this has nothing to do with me that realization is so important though all those things that I mean I don't know about you but certainly for me that all your life the way people behave towards you and treat you and the things they say about you it's really hard not to take all of that on and then that realization that it isn't anything to do with you it's them that's a massive game changer yeah totally is do you know when you started to realize that I know I've just done all the work to get to it I've just been working my ass off since I had a breakdown to understand what's happened who I am what I need, and I've done the work. I'm in therapy with somebody that's autistic ADHD, so she knows exactly what's going on, and she's a similar age to me. And it's just wonderful to be seen and to be understood. And, I mean, even coming here in the car, I looked up having just done a meditation, and I said to the driver, oh, which part of London are we in? And he said Highgate, and we weren't in Highgate. I know (laughs) London really well. And I just said to him, I don't think we are. So I Googled it and we weren't. But he was a bit angry. Everybody's spoiling for a fucking fight all the time. Mm. And you have to find your in it. It's all right. Mm. The guy's just feeling a little bit stressed. Not my problem. Yeah, he wasn't hearing the question. He was hearing Nobody hears some questions. implicit criticism. Yeah, yeah, wasn't he? exactly. Which means that he is insecure. And that's not my fucking problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think so many people just aren't used to direct questions. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I relish them because I can't bear bullshit. <laughs> that's so, that's so interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that the people in TV could even cope with you. 
Well, what do you mean? The, because it's steeped in bullshit. Well, the thing is, I, I didn't I didn't ever say anything. I, you know, Paul O'Grady knew oh. it. I mean, I worked with Paul and he'd come into my dressing room and we would slag the business off because it was so funny and ridiculous, the things that were happening. Because he's just a regular guy with, like, loads to say with a strong voice. But he's a man, he's allowed to say it. But it, I feel like he's just like me. Yeah. You know, like, it's just authentic. But so many people are playing the game and getting hurt in the game, but staying because they might not believe they can do anything else or they genuinely love it or they genuinely need it. And I'm not judging anybody, but for me, the most straight-talking, grounded person found it all like, are you all mad? This is just a show. Did you find that when you decided, okay, I don't want to work in broadcasting and be a presenter anymore. I want to find a new way. I want to seize my own narrative. Did you find not being Melanie Sykes broadcaster a problem? Did you feel like, who am I? No. No. I'm just me. I've got so much respect for that, though. Honestly, so many people, and I would include myself in this, that when you have a big career change, it takes, I mean, it took me ages to go, okay, if I'm not Sam Baker, magazine editor... Who am I? No, I didn't go, oh, God, people won't know me anymore. I don't get, I'd don't rather not. I say in the book, when masks came into things, I was so happy to be behind yeah. a mask. Yeah. I don't want to be on the show. I'm shy. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm really shy. I'm good one-on-one. Any more than three, I'm really like, you know, whether it be lunch or dinners, I tend to just sit back and let everybody else talk and just back out of it and keep my little whatevers. I don't need to be centre of attention. I've never needed to be centre of attention. It's not my bag. I've not even put myself on the cover of my book. No, that's true. I'm not that's interested. True. The words are what's important. My feelings and my thoughts, and I hope it helps people heal. But it's not a um, puff piece, and it's not a publicity thing. It's not because I want to go back into anything. It's just a book that's on the journey of the rest of my life. And, and the rest of my life, for me, is about helping people find themselves. It's about all the themes in the book about calling out misogyny, understanding what it is, getting perspective, travel, reading, educate yourself, put down the tabloids, stop watching the stupid news. Even when I was in my 20s, I always bought men's magazines because I knew what women think because I'm one. I am one. I didn't need a magazine to tell me about me. It's an education, you know, and I still do. You know, back in the day when the men's magazines were huge and you were kind of, you did like FHM and that, how did you feel about doing it at the time? Were you cool with it did you do it because your manager said you should yeah well I mean I talk about it in the book in that it was part of the culture of the time and I'd gone through a whole career of not taking my clothes off to taking my clothes off to be on television so it was kind of stupid and crazy yeah 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 it was mad it was ridiculous I hated it I felt I was always self-conscious you know sitting on set in a fucking negligee and you're like blue negligee and you're like thinking oh my god but whatever you just did what you were told to do because it would mean that you might get some more work but I wasn't bothered about being television when television came my way I kept telling everybody I didn't want to do it you know I told the executive producer of the big breakfast I didn't want the job he offered it me told me to go for a screen test he gave me the job and I said I didn't want it and he had to talk me into doing it and that's me all over I went into the head of ITV to say you know we we should make a documentary for Des he's not you know Des O'Connor he's not the strongest at the moment and instead of waiting to cobble some piece of shit after the fact thing let's do something a bit more beautiful and respectful for what he's given to the industry and he said yes straight away and then he said to me do you want to talk about you I was like oh no I'm not at this game and he's like you're the only person that comes in here and doesn't want a job but but, but when I've needed a job I've been able to go to Kevin I've literally been in to see Kevin and said I'm broke I really need a gig have you got anything for me and he's found something for me and he found me let's do lunch but that's because I went cap in hand I didn't go in there going I'm fabulous. What have you got? I'm like, I'm, I need I need an income. And if it's the right gig, and, it, you know, Let's Do Lunch was relatively good for me. You know, I, I felt like I was in my zone. You know, I could do it. But it's interesting. People would go, what do you know about cooking? And you're like, well, I cook for my children every single day yeah. <laughs> for the past 15 years. Is that not enough? Do I have yeah. to have gone to chef school? I mean, yeah, it's such exactly. bullshit. It's about boxes and, you know, and I don't fit in any box because I've got a million skills and a million talents. And I'm about to pursue them because I'm now my own boss. It's a freedom.
Do you think that all of this would have happened if you hadn't had that breakdown after the diagnosis? Because it seems like the breakdown became a breakthrough. And did you need... Well, breakdowns are breakthroughs. Not always. No, always. Can I tell you at the moment now, anything negative that happens in my day, I learn a lesson from it rather than the negative impact it has on me. And have you all... And it comes in straight away. Somebody irritates me and I go, patience. And I'm not going to blame anybody for rankling me. I'm going to work out what that meant to me. And it just flies in. Once you're grounded enough, once you're centred enough, it'll come straight at you. So you've done the work in terms of therapy. Have you done a lot of other work? Well, I do. I've been, I've been sober six years. Sobriety was definitely one of them. Being celibate for a year was another self-care experiment that paid off and worked obviously meditation has just been very much part of my life for like six or seven years exercise has been in my life since I was turned 38 and I'm now 53 in summer so I've never dropped the ball on that apart from when I had an injury last year and even that I thought I was never going to do a downward dog again but I've slowly slowly respected it rebuilt it and I'm back on form you know I take mushroom powders and I have my cannabis medicine. It's all healing. It's all natural healing. I'm not on any drugs. I don't need to be on any drugs, chemicals rather. I am operating only on natural medicines. So that's the work. So those are the things I'm doing. But it's it's an education. I read a lot. I research a lot and read a lot. It's like, you know, for me, I mean, I'm obsessively learning, but I've always been like that. It's really, really interesting. We're roughly the same age and we're going through our careers at the same time. And to have read the book and to have seen your life from your perspective as opposed to through the media and the TV lens and then to be listening to you now and just how on it you are. So on it. I am really on it. You are. But I'm really on it because I'm just really here. I ain't anywhere else but here. And I am very present wherever I go now. My head ain't anywhere else but here. So, yeah, it's just amazing, honest to God. I mean, if we ever met... Do you know what? I don't know. Right, so we probably didn't then, but I'm just... It's curious, isn't it? Because, like, I don't know what you thought of me. But I remember, like... (laughs) Janet Street Porter wrote some shit about me once and I drew some devil horns on her picture on the newspaper. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have your face yes, at the top yeah. and I drew some devil horns on her on her head and I photographed it and put it on Twitter and I said, stop perpetuating bullshit. And I was, how old was I then? I don't know, 44 and yeah. in the business. That's how much I'm like, why are you allowed to abuse me? Loads mm. of women have abused me on their columns. I mean, I remember one woman saying... Oh, I'm so heat sick of hearing about Melanie Sykes's love life. Well, have a have a conversation with your editor in chief because yeah. he's the one who keeps putting it in the fucking newspaper, not me. And you're even discussing it again for money. So don't blame me, motherfuckers. That's your industry. That's nothing to yeah. do with me. And that's what it's like now. And it's and it will change because I'm going to talk about it a lot more and out it for what it is. It's misogyny and it's been given to females to really stick the knife in and these women are doing it willfully and it just they're the biggest enemy to me more than any man will ever be to me as a Mm. woman that's not on side i mean there's two things there because there's like the massive double standards about the way women's private lives are treated in the media Mm -hmm. versus men's but also the way certain papers they always get the women to write that stuff they're just guns for hire because the men Mm. aren't they're too yellow belly to pull the trigger themselves they hide behind women it's it's kind of complex it's really really complex but i would never in a million years if my boss said to me you know you've really got to just ring her and ask her like something that she's not going to want to answer i'd be like i'm sorry i'm not doing that i found out that paula grady died because somebody at lorraine's production company had got my number i don't know how and told me that he'd it's so bad news about Paul, will you come in and talk about it? And it was six o'clock in the morning and oh I'm just like, God. that's how I found it. Not from a friend, oh but from God. somebody that shouldn't have my number and shouldn't be using it anyway. And it'll be some young person who doesn't mm. know me, doesn't know Paul, has been told by somebody senior to them. How out of order is that? Yeah, that's For disgusting. me as well. I was like, what the hell what's happened to Paul? That's how you found out. And that's yeah. how I found out. So I blocked her because... 
fuck you. And it's just, where do pe- where's the where's the empathy for people? Where's the grace? Mm. Where's the grace? Nobody's got any grace at all. Everybody's sitting around judging and filling airtime with nonsense. They don't care about what's happened. They just care about putting it on and how many hours we can talk about it. And nobody gives a shit about real things. Not in the mainstream media, they don't. I'm trying no. to find an alternative. I'm here talking to you because I don't want to talk to all them lot. Yeah. I'm not talking to them lot. And that's why I started the podcast, because I didn't want to be interviewing people with an editor sitting over my shoulder going, OK, well, the headline I want is this. Well, you know, you know. You've got to get this headline. They write the script before the thing is played out. And it's all based on the personality of the writer. And it has fuck all to do with the talent that they're talking to. I mean, yeah. I feel like I could go into any publication right now and sort them all out. Yeah. <laughs> I really feel like I could because I've just, mm. I see it. I see where it's flawed. There's a lot to change. There's a lot that's stagnant. But this country is stagnant. The energy mm. in this country country is stagnant. And, and I think the powers that be like it that way because I think they're like really, really vulnerable, angry people because they're easy to manipulate. It's just nonsense. I I I just gone to the gym the other day, and I and, and the lady said to me, oh, "I'm so glad I came to the gym this morning." She said, "Otherwise, we we and this is another thing people do with me all the time is we'd be in bed watching television, wouldn't we?" And I'm like, "Well, I I wouldn't actually because that's not me. But it's fine if that's you, and you're right. You should be at the gym rather than do that." And she said, "And also, it's all all bad news as well on the telly." And I thought, "Yeah, so don't do it. Stop doing it." I stopped watching the news and reading anything. I think it's nearly two years ago. Where do you get your kind of world information from? Well, sometimes I'll do a, a scoop round. So I'll have a look at different channels and what their first lines are. It's just to know what's being discussed, but I never delve too deeply. There's a political programme on Sunday morning and I've recorded it because I was out on Sunday and I still have to catch up with it, but I don't watch it as and when. I'll, I'll watch it when I can catch up with it. I'm, I'm interested in... Um, world politics and and the environment interests me, and it's I just find I find what I need, and I speak to people who will know. So I don't know. It's easy. You just find your own way. Yeah, you just curate it yourself. Yes, and, exactly. Rather than let someone else do it. For yeah, you. yeah. I just let. I just you know. I'm just becoming more me, and this is what I was. I've always been like. You know, I'm self taught in everything that I've done. And that really, that really shows, I think, because it's then that constant keeping learning. And I really think that that's such an important thing as you get older. If you just get a point to a point where you're just not interested in when you haven't got any curiosity anymore, that's oh, when you start getting old. Yeah, well, I don't. I'm, I'm just curious about everything. I've always been into everything. And then something off the back of that and I, I like how I learn is just and I love I love skills as well. So I like knowing how people do things and how they make things. And I'm just fascinated with like everything. And I don't restrict myself to ideas, especially, I don't know, you know, people say when I was in in Venice and I met Ricardo, who was 22 and I was 50, I don't have an age. I'm just spirited and I meet yeah. spirited people that I want to whirl around with for a while. Yeah. While it feels good and then when it doesn't feel good I'll whirl around with somebody else and that's man, woman and beast, right? Because <laughs> we're just energy. You know, people put so much onto certain things or restrictions about age and, you know, and I've been written off as some kind of like predator for young men and it's hilarious because I've been out with lots of different age groups and some have been famous and some haven't and I don't think about people in terms of what they do. Like, I don't think of me in terms of what I do. It's who I am that's important and it's the same when I meet people. Who are you? Who are you? You know, that's what I want to meet. Not some kind of curated person. It's like, what's that phrase? Is it sapiosexual? Yes. Is that the right phrase? That kind of, it's like, what's the person? What's going on behind their eyes? And that's what I mean, that's, that's Well, that's definitely, obviously, that's a male thing. But I get turned on by smart women. Do you know what I mean? I just don't want to fuck them. Yeah. As simple as exactly. that. All over my life as well, I've used to think, why am I so like a guy? Like and every time I read something, I think, well, that's me. And I read something in a women's magazine, well, that's not me. Yeah. So I've thought, am I more a man than a woman? The fact is, I'm not either. I'm just me. Yeah. 
So in the book, you said about, I can't remember when it was, a few years ago, it's probably when you did your year's celibacy, about your libido being a problem. No, I've just got high libido. I've always had a high libido. And is that why you did the celibacy for a year? I did it. And, and as I say in the book as well, is that basically, yes, um, because I wanted to have sex with someone, I would, but it didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily good for me, or they weren't particularly nice people. But if you're driven by your libido, which men are notorious for and women not so much which I think is bullshit because I think loads of women just mm. want to get fucked sometimes and there's nothing wrong with it but I also realised I needed a connection it's like putting a band-aid on something if you can resolve an argument with a really great fucking session of sex doesn't mean the problem is gone <laughs> And I thought, if I withdraw the sex, then the problems I can just avoid. Yes. And yeah. so I've just avoided. And after a year, I was so much more understanding of myself and had more respect for myself. I won't lay with anyone that isn't my equal ever again. And it's as simple as that. Because I don't like casual sex. I tried it, don't like it. But it doesn't stop me wanting to have sex because that's just me being a full-on woman who who likes it what's wrong there's nothing wrong with it no there's nothing wrong with it at all and that's the whole like media double standards thing like with jack and ricardo it's like so what if they were younger it wouldn't have been worthy of note if it was a bloke wouldn't have even no they do i think i know because i think some blokes get a load of shit for it and and it's really annoys me because i think what's his name the actor um leonardo Everybody slags him off for having younger women. And I'm just like, leave him alone, man. If the women are happy and he's happy, what's it got to do with you? But don't you think it's funny that he's getting older and older and the women are all staying at 21? No, I don't think it's funny. I think it's <laughs> normal. He's got a type. He likes them that age. <laughs> I mean, it got to a point where like, like, I had a few boyfriends on the bounce that were 27. So what? I just, you know, I like the energy of certain age. Men, men of my age, it's very rare to meet a man of my age with the energy that I fucking got. And I don't mean for, like, marathon sex sessions. I mean, just like, life. life. Do you know what? You hear that so often. The number of women I've spoken to are just like, I've got it all going on. I've got stuff I want to do, things I want to learn. And he just wants to play golf and have a Kung Pao chicken. I don't want to do that. That's not the rest of my life. Yeah, although I love golf, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and clay pigeon shooting. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that too, yeah. But I have to say, I mean, I love watching golf. But th- that's the thing is, if that's what your partner wants to do, then that's great. You just don't have to do it with him, you know. Yeah. We're all allowed our own lives, aren't we? And, you know, I don't see why marriage has to stop that happening. So if everybody could just work it out or just not get married or do whatever the fuck you want when you want, you know, how about that? We've only yeah. got one life. Life. And that's another thing about Paul's death is just like, I've just been like, every day I am going to drink it in. Every day. Because it's beautiful out there. You know, when I wasn't meditating, I was just looking at all the blossom and the beautiful colours in the sky and all the things that are there. Because when somebody says, oh, it was a grey day today. No, it wasn't. You just weren't looking. Totally. You know, and I popped out to, to Notting Hill the other day. I haven't been to Notting Hill. I used to live in Notting Hill when I was in my late 20s in the 90s and it was vibes, vibes, vibes. And I went there on Sunday and it's dead. I was just a bit like, I like where I live. It's got better energy. Not that it's relevant. You still live in central London? No, I'm in, out. I've just gone a bit out. further out. Yeah. I work with a local women's charity. And the, the biggest problem for my borough is coercive control and domestic mm. violence and and if it is the biggest problem for women in my borough it means it's the biggest problem for women across the country yeah it is the one thing that is the biggest problem women are in relationships that they shouldn't be and i just get it well it's like coercive control is the hardest thing to spot isn't it particularly when you're in it but like you talked in in the book about the way that you were self-editing in relationships and i think that's so I've definitely done that in a relationship when I was much younger. And I think that so many women will go, yeah, that kind of... I'm not quite sure who I am in this relationship because I'm so busy thinking, what should I say or not say or do or not do? But in my relationships, I've kind of just wanted to make them happy. That's all I want. expense, sometimes. Yeah. I've not really thought about me in it. That's been my problem is that I've always felt that other people need it. I mean, I have. I've just been really, really good to a lot of people who weren't good to me, basically. Didn't deserve it. Yeah, they didn't deserve me. What's your approach to relationships now? 
I would love to meet somebody, but like I say, it's going to be it's going to be a unicorn situation. But that's all right. It will be what it will be, and when I meet him, I'll know. But I'm not looking because I don't need to. Because when the time is right, it will happen. I've got no. I don't really mind. I'm really happy with me. And, but I would really love to travel and have fun with someone. I really would love a male companion for sure. For sure I would. Because, you know, the right man would just be so much fun. <laughs> so I'm getting, um, you know, I get excited about the, con- the, the, the the ideas of doing that. Because also I want to do Route 66. I want to do it on a motorbike. Yeah. I can't ride a motorbike, but I love bikes. There's things that I need a man to do the driving as well <laughs> and share it. But also have that protection. When I went to India, I asked Adam to come with me because he's my best friend. But also I knew that I was safe because not that India is not safe because India is safe and wonderful and beautiful. But there's certain traveling alone that I won't do. And we had belly laughs, like to tears laughing. And then we'd be crying about stuff. And I, I really want that in a lover. I want yeah. it in a lover. And there's no reason why you shouldn't have it. Well, I will. There's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind. So it's great. It's kind of exciting. How do you feel about, like, you're 53 now? Well, in August. In, don't, sorry, don't, sorry. Not, <laughs> not yet. yet. No. Not yet. 52 and, and a, a half. half. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be precise. <laughs> but it's funny because I've always done that, though. When it's the year of my next birthday, I start saying I'm that age. I have always done that. Do you know what? Someone else told me that as well. They kind of age themselves up a year so they get used to it. Oh, no, I don't do it for that reason. It's just that I'm literally there now. So I think, well, I'm 53 in August. Yeah, whatever. How do you feel about being in your 50s? Are you enjoying it? Do you like... I mean, I, I'm enjoying my life because I've sorted a lot of stuff out. But that's nothing to do with my age, I don't think. Yeah, it could not be, or it could be. For me, age is boring. I find it such a boring subject. I'll be honest, I do. <laughs> I'm ageless. I am just a spirit in flesh and bones. They will go, but my spirit will be as it is and as it was forever because I am a spirited person. Age, I don't think about it. Do you know what? It's only my thing because I want to celebrate all the things that women are capable of, whatever their age. But, but I've always, that's been my narrative forever. I mean, in my 40s, everybody's asking me about turning 40. Oh, my God. You know, and like, I was at my absolute physical peak (laughs) at 46. Um, Ashley, can I ask you one more thing? A few weeks ago, when we were first started talking about setting this up, you had lost your voice. Mm. Do you think that's connected to stuff that goes on in your life or was it just a sore throat? Yeah, it was an emotional (laughs) reaction to something, yeah. It was an emotional reaction to something that I healed and it came back. And in the time that it had gone, I started to learn sign language because I kept thinking, well, just why don't you just learn some things? And I'm glad you asked me about it because it was a really interesting time because people responded to me in such a strange way. You know, people that haven't met before probably thought I was quite a, um, a weak old lady lady and I wasn't and not my voice was weak but I'm not but people would talk to me a little bit like I was a little old lady and I found it really interesting because I thought wow you have no idea what power is here you making a judgment because I can't share it but it's fine because I know I've got it I'm not here to to change your perception of me it was all an education on self and it came back by humming humming's very good for the throat Mm, it's a it is a hum is the vibration of the throat and it loosened because I had a paralyzed vocal cord that's really fascinating yeah so to hum and to om just loosened it up and I was doing a meditation and om came in and I was doing an om and I thought oh god that feels really good and then my mum rang me and said humming's good humming's good and then a couple of days later it started to come back it's not 100% back because at the back I feel tension sometimes but it'll come back yeah but it was interesting interesting. yeah Yeah, it was a really interesting interesting time okay questions that I always ask at the end what is your emotional age or spirit age whatever you I don't know I think I'm probably kind of like I'd say seven seven or eight why is that do you think uh, because I'm just so free and um I like I, I love like doing what I used to do then is like go to my bedroom and get my magazine out and get my books out and just I'm just about seven or eight I think I love that give us a book recommendation 
It's called Inshallah United, a story of faith and football. And it's Nuruddin Chowdhury. And it's about Man United. He's a Muslim from Manchester, working class lad, being brought up. I mean, it just, it's like buzzes me because he speaks my language. You're a big book reader, aren't you? Yeah, massive. Every single book I've ever read has done something for me. And there isn't one it's all of them, each and every one of them. And I don't even know how many that is. I, I actually don't. And so I couldn't possibly. But that one made me roar. And I've started another one. I'm reading Roy Keane now. Roy Keane's second. <laughs> yeah, because he's one of the only authentic people on television at the moment. You know, he is the real deal and speaks his truth and doesn't give a shit about what people think. And I think it's important that we all start just being... Even if just one person does and then another person, it just starts. Well, you, you've got, you can only lead by example. And that's what I intend to do. I'm, I'm, I don't want to sit and tell people how to be. I'm just going to be me. And if you think that looks like something you might want to be like, then do that. But like, be yourself more than anything else. What advice would you give younger women? My friends age from 20 to 80 something. Yeah. So they all bring their wisdom. But all I would hammer on to him, because somebody I know was working in a kitchen and the, the chefs were being a bit, you know, like misogynistic. And she was told, you know what, just it's just chefs. It's what they do. Just get on with your job. So I'd say, don't go, yeah, that's just chefs and that's how they are. Or that's just bankers because that's how they are. Or mm. it's just men, you know what they're like. No, we don't. We know what they're like and we don't fucking like it. Some men. So we, I, I would just say to young women, you've got to call it out. Don't be fearful of losing your job. If you are uncomfortable at work for any reason, you need to tell somebody. I think we all need a Melanie in our pocket. <laughs> my, my trainer said that to me the other day. I, I've got a trainer at the local gym, yeah, and he was having problems with certain things. And I was like, you need to go into management. You need to say this, 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 and this. And he was just like, can you come with me? <laughs> I want to help everybody, that's the thing. Because it's not that hard to do, honestly. Your intuition is your magic key to your happy life. It is as simple and as cut and dry as that. And nobody can say to me, oh, it's all right for you because you've got loads in the bank. I ain't got a pot to piss in right now. I'm (laughs) broke. So that's bullshit. You know, I've been on my arse financially for two years now. But I have found myself. And it's not even the first time I've been broke. I've been broke loads in my life. I'm 53. What does people think I've been living in some ivory tower? And maybe they do, but it's just a nonsense. They probably do. Yeah, 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 but it's just just silly, you know. It's just silly. I mean, some people do actually can genuinely see that I'm like a normal person. (laughs) But some people just can't see past the fame. But that's their shit, not mine. Yeah. Um, and last one, how many fucks did you give? Oh, I don't give a fuck about what people think of me, but I give a fuck about a lot of people and a lot of situations. Of course, I'm, 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 a, I'm an activist. I want to make change. I want to be doing that. I care massively about that. But I don't really, I don't really care how you see me. Of course not, because that's you don't know me. And so whatever you see me as is, is about you. I think a load more people need to think about that in their own lives. Yeah. I don't think people realise it's got nothing to do with the person they're saying it about or to. It's really true. Thank you so much for doing this, Manny. Oh, my God, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's been great. Good. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to support The Shift further, please consider becoming a member of our community. Find out more at steady.media forward slash The Shift.